Hello, my name is Leah Ray and I'm a first year PhD researcher at the Transitional Justice Institute at Ulster University. I'm grateful to be presenting at today's conference. This paper arises from the focus of my PhD research, which examines the operation of constitutional conventions established by historic and contemporary devolution settlements in the history of Northern Ireland and the relationship and progression of human rights standards here. As the title suggests, the dominant argument I'm proposing is constitutional conventions established by historic and contemporary devolution settlements in the history of Northern Ireland have played a role in the non-advancement of human rights standards in the region due to strict adherence by successive British governments, evidence within parliamentary business proceedings. While such conventions are necessary to recognise and respect the executive decision making and legislative parameters established by the devolution models implemented in Northern Ireland, in the absence of legislative action by the devolved government to ensure state compliance with international human rights standards, these conventions arguably do not prevent the sitting British government from undertaking any necessary legislative action directed by any issues in accordance with obligations under international law to ensure compliance with treaty standards. Constitutional conventions have an important role in the operation of constitutional systems. Classical constitutional scholarship recognises this. Dicey classified conventions as rules which may regulate the conduct of members of the sovereign power. Jennings further argued conventions are critical to ensuring the successful and efficient functioning of the constitution. As regulatory rules, they consequently necessitate adherence. Phillips recognised the binding effect of conventions upon constitutional actors and we are held to conventions of behavioural rules that constitutional actors accept as obligatory. Within the UK, constitutional conventions arising from devolution settlements are necessary to ensure the functioning of the respective devolution models in place across the region, preventing devolution settlements from being undermined by recognising corresponding legislative competencies and effectively affirming the relationship between the UK Parliament and the devolved legislators. However, the relative vagueness of such conventions in practice, including their policy scope and operation and development over time, can be problematic. This is particularly apparent in the context of the International Human Rights Framework, the corresponding obligations to maintain compliance placed upon the state signatories, and how this can effectively operate in practice within the centralised evolved constitutional model of the UK. It's this issue my research seeks to examine, focusing on the case study of Northern Ireland. The operation of both historic and contemporary conventions arising from these settlements has resulted in a trend of delayed progress in the advancement of human rights standards in Northern Ireland since its formation, raising ongoing questions in respect of human rights standards here and the role of the Westminster Parliament in this. Now, the issue of human rights protection in Northern Ireland is protracted and equally as protracted as the matter of responsibility for addressing outstanding human rights concerns and undertaking legislative action. As I will illustrate, these entwined matters are just as entwined in the history of Northern Ireland. And my paper reveals the cyclic pattern of associated discourse from campaign groups highlighting disparity in human rights standards across the UK and urging legislative action from Westminster. And in response, successive British governments asserting constitutional conventions upholding the legislative competencies of the devolved institutions prohibited uh, the government from directly intervening in Northern Ireland. However, whilst recognising responsibility for human rights compliance in the first instance resides upon the devolved government in Northern Ireland, the British government holds a long-standing role as a guarantor of human rights standards in the UK, arising from its obligation to ensure compliance with standards contained within international treaties to which it is a state signatory. This enables the British government to act on matters pertaining to human rights standards within the UK's devolved nations, irrespective of constitutional convention. International law, namely Article 27 of the Vienna Convention 1969, does not permit the invoking of domestic law as a reason for non-compliance. And this is also grounded in Section 98 of Northern Ireland Act 1998 as regards necessary legislation from Westminster to ensure international obligations are met. The paper I'm presenting today seeks to illustrate the role played by constitutional conventions in the matter of human rights advancement in Northern Ireland by demonstrating historic and contemporary examples of the utilisation of these conventions established by devolution settlements by British government representatives. This examination was conducted by utilising content analysis via historical and political lens and ascertaining the extent constitutional conventions relating to the Operation Devolution have affected the progression of human rights standards in Northern Ireland since the creation of the state. Parallels were identified between the operation of historic and contemporary devolution settlements here, namely the ramifications for the progression of human rights standards due to the operation of the corresponding constitutional conventions outlining the permissive parameters of legislative action by successive British governments. So the Government of Ireland Act 1920 created a new constitutional arrangement in the UK, the creation of Northern Ireland and the establishment of a devolved governance structure. Arising from this was a new parliamentary convention at the Westminster Parliament. Affairs that were within the province of the Stormont government were not permitted to be discussed at Westminster. 
Between the 2nd and 3rd of May 1923, Frank Gray MP sought a ruling from the then Speaker Whitley as to whether MPs could put questions to the Prime Minister or the Home Secretary as regards proceedings in Northern Ireland. On the 3rd of May 1923, then Speaker Whitley ruled that with regard to those subjects which have been delegated to the Government of Northern Ireland, questions must be asked of Ministers in Northern Ireland and not in this House. During the terms of success of British governments, the scope of this convention widened. It was established the British government itself did not intervene in affairs deemed responsibility of the Northern Ireland government. Now, by the 1960s, the grassroots civil rights movement mobilised in Northern Ireland as a consequence of alleged human rights violations, particularly evident in housing and enfranchisement and the lack of political movement at Stormont to address same. This movement sought to challenge the persistent refusal of the Northern Ireland government to legislate to prohibit discrimination and or to uphold human rights standards. Section 75 of that 1920 Act stated, regardless of the establishment of the Northern Ireland Parliament, Westminster retains supreme authority over all persons, matter and things. Following the mobilisation of the civil rights movement, it was submitted, the Act permitted the Westminster Parliament to intervene to legislate to address human rights violations in the absence of action at Stormont. However, it had proven difficult to challenge success of British governments regarding the very meaning and scope of the Section 75 provision, let alone its relationship with the progressive realisation of human rights standards due to the Parliamentary Convention at Westminster. When pressed on the implications of Section 75, the deteriorating situation in Northern Ireland, the then Labour government asserted human rights issues were the responsibility of the devolved Parliament, relying upon the convention established by Speaker Whitley in 1923. And this convention was repeatedly upheld within parliamentary business. On the 8th of August 1966, Jerry Fitt MP tabled a debate on the operation of the convention within the context of the British government legislative intervention per section 75. And as you can see here, he was promptly reminded of convention by then Deputy Speaker Sir Eric Fletcher, which saw discussion of the situation regarding rights in Northern Ireland sharply curtailed. During this time, there was a persistent refusal of the sitting Northern Ireland government to legislate to prohibit discrimination or to uphold human rights standards. Indeed, it actively sought to block any efforts from opposition MPs to progress such legislation. A bill which attempted to introduce impartiality in the allocation of employment and housing was rejected by the Northern Ireland government and deemed unnecessary. A racial discrimination bill to render illegal discrimination on colour, race or religion was also rejected. There were four attempts by Sheila Murnaghan MP to introduce bills of rights between 1964 and 1968 and all fell as the Northern Ireland government argued in shining human rights protections was not a legislative matter. Now, sympathetic allies to the movement, including Labour backbencher Paul Rose MP, made appeals to the British Prime Minister Howard Wilson, requesting that the then Labour government introduce, through Westminster, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland to ensure parity of rights across the whole of the UK. <clears throat> These appeals did not succeed on the grounds of the operation of the Constitutional Convention. Then Prime Minister Harold Wilson and Home Secretary Jim Callaghan, however, both recognised the British government was a sovereign power in matters of human rights and international responsibility to ensure such throughout the UK. Now, it's been posited that Labour government hid behind the convention to avoid responsibility and political fallout at this time, and that's actually a position that Paul Rose himself took. <clears throat> I think it's interesting to note the consistency of the interpretation, <clears throat> pardon me, of this convention within parliamentary proceedings between both chambers at Westminster and the House of Lords in the same time frame. Government ministers did affirm the convention, citing it prevented the government from answering questions on matters arising in Northern Ireland, most notably the situation regarding human rights violations. However, ministers did not seek to curtail debate within the chamber. Indeed, as evidenced by Lord Stoneham's contribution on 3rd December 1968, the interpretation of Lords was peers could discuss matters arising in Northern Ireland, including the application of Section 75 of the 1920 Act of Situation, but the government could not broach the subject. Now, the matter of operational interpretation of constitutional conventions in Parliament is still very much ongoing. In January uh, 2017, the then Deputy First Minister Mark McGuinness announced his resignation from the post. This was primarily due to ongoing developments in respect of the RHI crisis. However, a prominent factor provided was the ongoing failure of the devolved institutions, especially the executive, to advance human rights standards with failure to ensure progression of legislation of abortion and the legal protection of the Irish language being specifically cited. In the absence of devolved institutions between 2017 to 2019, the British government was urged to undertake legislative action to address various human rights concerns. The then May government initially affirmed a Seal Convention in Parliament, asserting the introduction of legal reform to rectify these human rights concerns was the responsibility of the NI Executive and the NI Executive alone. See, for example, the example of then Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Karen Bradley, in response to Stella Chris EMP on the subject of abortion reform. This approach, however, ended during the passage of what was then the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Bill in July 2019, which through amendments tailored by opposition backbenchers were in an interesting moment for established convention, accepted for debate by then Speaker Barakai, and subsequently resulted in the Westminster Parliament legislating to reform the law governing termination of pregnancy and to legalise the extension of same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. 
The absolute government opposition in line with convention, however, was a more delicate navigation of the Sewell Convention. The May government merely extended a free throw to its backbenchers. It did not publicly accept the amendments. The matter of affirmation of the Sewell Convention via the reform of abortion law remains contentious. Upon a decriminalisation of abortion in October 2019 and the introduction of regulations in March 2020 by the Secretary of State, accordance with Section 9 of the Executive Formation Act 2019, then an executive seemingly dried his heels around full implementation of the law. In the absence of the full commissioning of abortion services, redress was sought from the NIO to ensure full implementation as the Human Rights Commission commenced a legal challenge on the grounds of failure to commission services constituted human rights violations. The NIO, by way of Minister Robin Walker at the beginning of 2021, affirmed the Seal Convention, but with a caveat. Responsibility resided with Northern Ireland Executive, but the NIO was considering introducing additional legislative measures, if appropriate and required. Fresh regulations were eventually laid in March 2021 and provided that the Secretary of State could direct relevant persons such as the First and Deputy First Ministers and Executive Ministers to undertake action necessary to ensure compliance with UN CEDAW and implementation of UN CEDAW Committee's recommendations within its investigative report of 2018. However, this has not yet been availed upon and the issue of non-commissioned services continues in Northern Ireland. The interesting parliamentary moment of July 2019 previously noted did not establish precedent. A prolonged issue in Northern Ireland has been the evident failure of successive executives to adopt legislation for the Irish language in accordance with international standards, for example, per the European Charter for Regional Minority Languages, despite successive commitments and various political agreements since 1998. It's an issue upon which successive British governments have seemingly feared to tread. When asked by an MP whether the UK government would uphold its commitment under the St Andrews Agreement in 2006 and introduce standalone legislation for the Irish language in Northern Ireland, the then Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Karen Bradley, responded this was a devolved power and constitutional devolution arrangements would be undermined by the House if the UK government were to legislate directly. This positioning was, however, refuted by the Committee of Experts for the European Charter which submitted during its fifth report that due to the absence of the devolved institutions and political tensions in respect of legislation for protection of the Irish language, such legislation should be passed at central government level and further emphasised it was an obligation of the UK King, United Kingdom to implement the undertaking selected for the Irish language. As you may be aware, the restoration devolved government in Northern Ireland has not proven fortuitous for the protection of the Irish language. The new decade new approach agreement 2020 provided for a fresh commitment in to the protection of Irish with a draft lang Irish language bill published in conjunction with the 2020 agreement. Over a year has passed and no bill has been introduced to Northern Ireland Assembly by the current Northern Ireland Executive. In the midst of concern the bill may face obstruction or be time barred in light of a scheduled Assembly election 2022. There was a seminal moment in June 2021 last month whereby the Secretary of State Brandon Lewis announced in the event the Northern Ireland Executive did not introduce the necessary cultural bill outlined in 2020 agreement by September 2021, the relevant legislation would be introduced by the British Government in the House of Commons. The delivery of this pledge, however, remains to be seen, and so too does the future of ongoing governmental adherence to constitutional conventions as regards human rights matters in Northern Ireland, and the juxtaposition of its political agenda and actions in Parliament of its obligations under international law. So in summary, I've identified some themes arising from the research for this paper for further consideration. So the non-advancement of human rights in Northern Ireland, despite provisions within various political agreements due to a lack of political consensus at devolved government level, Non-compliance at devolved institutional level with standards outlined in international law in Northern Ireland, which also then reveals that trend of disparity in rights protection recognition across the United Kingdom. Thirdly, the operational constitutional convention and its utilisation by city, sitting British governments. Despite the absence of progression or the very obvious non-compliance at devolved level, successive British governments have argued constitutional conventions governing the operation of devolution prohibits legislative intervention. And finally, the non-compliance at central government level Successive British governments have failed to uphold obligations under international law, which does not permit the invoking of domestic law as a reason for non-compliance. This is also grounded, again, to remind you in Section 98 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, as regards necessary legislation from Westminster to ensure international obligations are met in Northern Ireland. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I greatly welcome your questions and your comments.